So as you know, we are in a relationship series. We have been laying the foundations in the first sermon on what family is. Last week we then talked about forgiveness. A quick summary of what we talked about. First of all, we defined what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness does not mean I'm forgetting what has happened. It doesn't mean I'm denying the pain or anything like that. It doesn't mean that I'm ignoring it and I'm just pretending that everything is good. None of that is really forgiveness. What forgiveness is really all about is letting go of our right to revenge. When someone offends us, they've taken away something from us. Whether it's our peace, our joy, our money, something they've taken away. And when we forgive, we say, I choose not to repay. I choose not to pay back. And then we looked at that parable in Matthew 18, and we said our ability to forgive others is really evidence of genuine faith. If we are able to forgive others, that means that we have received forgiveness, and that means that we are truly saved. If we are unable to forgive others, we might be one of those servants who has a huge debt, has it forgiven, but then still thinks that we have to get back from everyone else. And that, then in that parable, brings the master back into the scene and he says, I don't pay for your debt any longer. You are going to prison. And the conclusion was, well, Jesus said, God treats us exactly like that servant if we don't forgive one another from our hearts. So if we are not able to forgive others, we need to ask ourselves whether we have truly received forgiveness from God and whether we are truly Christians. It's not an optional thing. It's not something that we kind of can do if we feel like doing it. It's very much connected with whether we are genuinely saved, whether we are genuine Christians. So that's what forgiveness is. And today we'll talk about the next step. Because forgiving is one thing, and that's something we all have to do, But that doesn't mean that everything immediately becomes restored, right? Because the consequences of sin remain. If someone steals my wallet, I can choose to forgive, but that doesn't mean that the next day my wallet will be in my mailbox and I have the money back. If someone punches me in the face, I can choose to forgive, but I might still have a broken nose. A more serious example, if someone gets raped something like this, and even gets pregnant. Now that person can choose to forgive, but the child is still there, and we still need to deal with the consequences. If someone mobs me out of my job, I need to forgive, I choose to forgive, but that doesn't mean I automatically get my job back. So forgiveness is not an optional thing. We can and we must forgive, but the consequences very often remain, and we have to deal with them. We cannot just ignore them. One of the things we then often deal with is anger. Someone offends us, we can choose to forgive, but we very often still feel angry. At least I do. And that's our topic for today. How do we deal with that? What can we do when we are angry? Let's talk a moment about feelings in general. If you read the Bible seriously, you'll see that God is very, very emotional. He is angry. He is joyful. He is peace. Not that he has peace, but he is peace. He is love. All these things are attributed to God. And so we have to admit that God is a very emotional being. So we have no slide, so I'll have to read it from here. Psalm 7 says, God judges the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked wicked every day. That's his feelings. Psalm 78 says this. How often did they... Let me get to the light. How often did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? So there are emotions. There's grievance in him. For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. 
There's no doubt if we take the Bible seriously. God is full of emotions. He is full of feelings. We are created in the image of God, and that means we can experience the kind of feelings that God experiences as well. That's part of what it means to be created in God's image, to be created in his likeness, that we can experience God's emotions. So feelings in and of themselves are not good and they are not bad. There are no bad feelings. There are only feelings we don't like. Anger, frustration, sadness, hatred, they in themselves are not bad. We might not like them, but these are feelings that God has himself as well. There are also no good feelings. Sometimes we feel happy, we feel loved, we feel successful. These feelings are not better than these other feelings. Feelings just are. Feelings in themselves are not good or bad or anything. But our feelings usually tell us something about reality. If I feel angry, it shows me something is wrong. Something that I value got violated. If I feel happy, it tells me something is right. Something is the way I want it to be. If I feel envious, then it tells me that something is being taken away from us that we think is ours. If we feel sad, we feel like we lost something. If we feel worried, we feel concern about our future. So feelings tell us something about our perceived reality. Now what we cannot do is simply allow our feelings to determine all our actions. Because then we'll go some pretty bad ways. Simple example, I'm married. If I was attracted to another woman, I cannot allow my feelings to lead to my actions. Because I made a vow to be faithful to my wife. And so if I was attracted to someone, I cannot just say, I feel this way, so I'll just do it. That would be a terrible sin. Another example, if I feel sad about a form of friendship that broke for whatever reason, if I did something wrong or the other person did something wrong, my feelings probably tell me to gossip, to hate, to cut relationships, and to be very negative about the whole thing. But instead, I can also say, I feel sad, and it drives me to restoration. It drives me towards doing something against my sadness. The thing is, feelings have the power to influence us, to influence our actions. If I feel successful in a certain area, it makes me feel good, and then I want to do it again. That's how many people choose their job. They're successful in a certain area, they feel good about it, and so they say, I want to make a career out of that. And there's nothing wrong with that. If I feel in love, and I'm single, then I might say, my feelings determine my actions, and I might want to pursue a relationship. If I feel hatred, I tend to avoid whatever I hate, whether it's a person or a thing or whatever. If I feel frustrated, I might feel tempted to give up and to say, I don't want to deal with this any longer, so I'm not going to do this any longer, and I'm giving up. Feelings just are. Feelings in themselves are not good or bad, but we have to be aware feelings influence our actions. So we can use our feelings as a tool that drive us to good actions, or we can allow our feelings to lead us in the wrong direction. And that's where it matters. It doesn't matter too much how we feel about a certain situation, but what matters is what do we do with our feelings? And how do we allow our feelings to influence our actions? That's what God is judging us for. Now let's go one step deeper. We are in a relationship series after all. So let's face reality. The closer a relationship gets, the more feelings are involved. Right? Both the feelings we like, but also the feelings we don't like. They are all there. All types of feelings intensify the closer a relationship gets. 
Now, consequently, you cannot be in a relationship, in a long-term relationship, without getting mad at each other, without being angry with each other at times. You cannot live in a family and see each other each day and all these things without, at certain times, re being really angry with the other person. The closer the relationship is, the more anger you will feel at times. In superficial relationships, you can always walk away and you can say, okay, I don't care about you, I don't care about our relationship, so before I get angry, I'll just walk away and I'll just leave it there. But in marriage, in family, you cannot do that. You have to face it and you have to deal with your anger. I know some pastors who have a policy, they say, I do not marry two people who didn't have a real fight. Now, this doesn't mean physically fighting, but what they mean is, I don't marry people unless they had a really sharp disagreement, until they were really upset with each other, until they really had problems that they had to work through together. And until they've done that, I'm not gonna marry them. Now, I'm not sure if I agree 100% with it, but I get their point. Because if two people only have this kind of romantic feelings for each other, but they never faced difficulty together, they never got upset with each other, they never faced any kind of trouble with each other, they never got emotional, and they worked through it in a good way, it might be that they are not ready for marriage because they have not seen much of each other yet. You can always be good to each other when you're in love, but it's a total different thing when you're angry with each other. And until we have seen that side of the other person, it might not be the best idea to get married. And it might really be wise to wait a few more months and to really face some difficulties together before making a lifetime commitment. So these are some of the foundations that before we get into the topic. So if we look at all this, it's not really surprising that the Bible really separates sin and anger. These are two different things. Because for example, in Ephesians 4, the verse that we read in the beginning, it says, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. So this verse makes it very clear. You can be angry. You will be angry at times. That's just part of life. But when you are angry, you have to be spe specifically careful don't sin, because that's when we are most tempted to do something that we know we should not do. Another foundation, anger is really an expression of love. Sounds contradictive? I thought so too in the beginning, but it's actually true. Let me just give you this example. If someone hurts my children, I get angry. I get really angry. Why? Because I love them. If someone says bad things about Jesus, I get angry. Why? Because I love Jesus. And I want his name to be honored. If I hear about wars and all the kind of stuff that we hear about in the news, I get angry. Why? because I love people. Anger happens when something we, we value, something we love, gets violated. And so anger is really an expression of love. Put it another way around, if I don't get angry, it probably means I don't care. If someone were to hurt my kids and I don't get angry, that would probably mean I don't really love them the way your father should. Someone curses Jesus, and I'm like, well, whatever. That probably means I don't really care about Jesus' name. If I'm not moved with compassion at all the tragedy that is going on, then that probably means that I'm not really loving people in the way that me, as a Christ follower, is supposed to love people. So love expresses itself in a hatred, in anger, towards the opposite. And if there is no anger, if there is no hatred... There is no love. These two things go hand in hand. 
Let's apply this principle to God. God loves people. God is love. He created us for a love relationship, and that's why we're here for. So if he loves us, he hates everything that harms us. What harms us? Sin. That's why there's such a hatred in God towards sin. Every sin that is committed in this world harms people, directly or indirectly. We suffer. God loves us, and that's why he gets angry when, he, when we get hurt, and that's why he gets angry when we sin. Doesn't mean he hates people who sin, but he, lo- he loves the worst sinner, but he hates the sin that we commit. And there's really no contradiction here. When I, my children do something bad, I get angry at what they did, but that doesn't mean I hate them. I still love them, and I want the best for them, but I'm really angry at what they do. My love for them doesn't change, but I want them to grow up and to do good things so that they can have the best life possible. Let me just give you a real example from this week. Earlier this week, our smallest one, Abigail, she threw food in the trash can that she didn't want to eat. I was angry. I was mad at her. I had to discipline her. I was really very frustrated at what she did, especially since two minutes before that she said, I want candy, and I said, you cannot have candy until you've eaten this first, and then she threw it away. It just totally showed what was in her heart at the moment. I was very angry at her. But even though I had to discipline her, and even though she was angry with me for a time, my love for her didn't change. And I made everything I could, I did everything I could to make up with her and to restore that relationship. And an hour later or two hours later, everything was fine. And I don't think she's going to do that again because she realized that disobeying daddy in something like this, it harms her. So that's how I treat her. Now let's just assume I go out on the street and I see another kid doing the same thing, throwing away food. Do I do the same? No. It's not my child. I don't have the same love for the children on the street that I have for my own daughter. And that's why I don't go to that child and discipline that child and tell that child what he or she did wrong. I'm like, none of my business. You shouldn't do this, but I really don't get involved. You have your own parents. They need to teach you. And I don't have the love for you that I have for my own children. So I let them go because it's not my business. And that's exactly what God does with us as well. He disciplines us, and he corrects us, and sometimes he frustrates our ways, and he says, Bernd, you cannot do that any longer, in whatever ways he does that. But he does that because he loves us. He hates the sin we commit. He disciplines us for the sins that we do commit, but he does it because of love, in the same way that we love. Discipline, love and discipline our own children. Discipline is really an expression of love. It's how God expresses his love for us. So obviously, there are two types of anger we feel. There's a righteous anger. That's the kind of anger that God feels. God hates sin. God hates when people get hurt. But in Malachi, it even states it, God hates divorce. doesn't mean he hates divorced people, but he does clearly say in that book, God hates divorce. That's a righteous anger, an anger against sin that is happening. But there's also an unrighteous anger. That's when it's about me, my selfishness, my pride, my jealousy, my guilt, all these things. If that's what's in my heart, then, of course, it has nothing to do with God. Then I just, I'm just frustrated because I don't get my way. 
if I'm angry because I didn't get the last piece of cake that I wanted, it's just about me. If I'm angry because someone didn't give me the attention and the praise that I wanted, I did so well, and then my boss comes, and I expect that I, he's kind of like giving me a raise and praising me and telling everybody how great a job I did and all these things. And then he's just like, okay, thanks, here's the next project. And I get angry over that? Then it's just about me. Then it's just about how I feel. And then it's just selfish. If I'm angry that my neighbor has a new car and I don't, that's just selfish. That's just about me. Now, this is obviously very simplified. This is obviously only, um, these are some very obvious examples. But I really hope you're getting the point. There's a righteous anger that points towards sin, and that is okay. But there is also a selfish anger, an unrighteous anger, when it's just about me. And that's not really important. And that's the kind of anger we really need to get rid of and get over with because then we are just destroying our own lives. So now that we have to define the two types of anger, what else does the Bible tell us about this topic? One of the things that it says is anger needs to be dealt with quickly. For example, now I just need to find it in this printout. Ephesians 4, 26, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. That's one verse. There's another verse in Hebrew, exactly. I'm all over the place right now without the screen. <laughs> Hebrews 12 says this. Looking diligently, diligently, lest any man fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby may be defiled. What's the nature of roots? Roots are the source of all kinds of other stuff. I grew up on a farm, so I know from my mother and from my, uh, I, just from the way I grew up how important roots are. If you have bad roots, if you have weeds somewhere in your garden, how do you get rid of it? There's only one way. Get rid of everything. Really turn over the whole area and get out all the roots. What many people try to do is you just, uh, you just take care of the surface. You just unplug the leaves that you don't like. But what will happen? It'll just grow back. Until you deal with the problem, until you deal with the roots, nothing is going to change. You're just delaying the inevitable. And the roots will just, under the earth, will grow longer and longer and stronger and stronger. And it will, it's just a matter of time until they take over your whole garden. These kind of roots are very, very powerful, even though you cannot see them. And the longer you let them grow, the, more, the bigger the problem becomes. And what this verse in Hebrews is saying is basically, anger is like a root. It's just that. It can grow in all kinds of other stuff. It can grow into hatred. It can grow into gossip. It can grow even into murder and all kinds of things that people do. If we don't deal with our anger quickly, it's like roots. Things will get worse and worse. The root will grow and grow and grow. Anger will take roots in our hearts and minds, and it will lead to bad actions. Because the more it grows, the more it will affect us. And it will get harder and harder to get rid of the roots. We have to deal with the roots and not just with the symptoms. We cannot simply say, okay, I'm going to stop gossiping. That's not going to help. If the root of my gossip is anger, I need to deal with my anger and not with my behavior. That's where it all comes from. We have to deal with the anger. And we have to be aware our emotions influence our self-control. When, uh, when we are angry, our emotions can easily lead us to do things we would never, ever think we could do. 
Have you ever in your anger said really harmful words to someone else? When I say, no, I never use bad words against my wife. I never use bad words against my children. And then in anger, suddenly something happens. And I say words that I never thought I would ever use. Can you relate to that? Or if I say, I will never gossip. I will never talk badly about anyone. But then I get angry. And suddenly it all comes out. Or I will say, I will always, when, I'm, when something goes wrong, I will always talk with another person. I will never allow these kind of misunderstandings to separate me from my friends or something like this. But then suddenly I'm angry. And what do I choose to do? I just ignore the other person. And I just try to stay away from the other person. In more extreme cases, what do people do? Sometimes people destroy stuff. They really, they become violent. And they do crazy stuff. Some people in anger, they murder. They commit suicide. They do physical harm themselves or other people. Talking about relationships again, many relationship, many people, when they have an affair, it's rooted in anger. Because they get so upset with their spouse that they do something really, really stupid. Anger in itself isn't bad. But we have to be aware. Anger can lower our self-control. And it can even completely remove it. So if we don't deal with our anger, we will soon regret. So let's get practical. What can we do? We have established the foundations. Anger is not sin. We have established the foundation. There are no bad feelings. Only feelings we don't like. We have established the foundation. Anger tells us something about our perceived reality. That's not necessarily true, but this is how we perceive things. Anger tells us something about that something we value got violated or is in danger. That's when we become angry. So on the basis of these foundations, what should we do when we feel angry? What can we do? Well, first of all, we need to get the root, to the root of our anger. First important question is, why am I angry? We always need to ask ourselves that question. If we simply try to answer this question, we will already learn a lot about what's going on. I'm angry because I'm in pain. I'm angry because my spouse is in pain. I'm angry because I was treated unfairly. I'm angry because what's happening in my company is hurting people. Whatever the reason is, but we have to come to answer this question. Why am I angry? What's going on? In my perception, what is it that I value that got violated? That's the first important question we need to answer. Another important question we need to answer, who or what am I angry with? Because if we don't know, how do we want to deal with our anger? We can't resolve the problem. If I try to solve a problem, but I don't know who or what I'm angry with, then I'm just in, totally in the dark. Am I angry with myself? Am I angry with a specific person who did something bad? Am I angry with a group of people? Am I angry with society, with mankind as a whole? Who or what am I angry with? Let me just give you a simple example. Let's just assume I was in a company and there's a lot of gossip going on. There's a lot of bad talking going on. If everybody does it, then, of course, I need to realize I'm angry with a group of people. I'm really angry with what's going on in this community. And if I then try to solve the problem, do something about it, I need to do that on a company level. I cannot try to convert to correct one person after the other then I really need to say something to my boss and say like, hey, I don't like what's going on here. Can we do something about it? Now, if it's just one person, I shouldn't bring it to my boss. The Bible is very clear about that. If you have a problem with one person, talk to the person one-on-one. -on -one. Because then we would make things a lot worse. So we need to be very clear. Who or what am I angry with? 
Because if we address the wrong target, we are just making things worse. Who or what am I angry with? Next important question, how am I contributing to the problem? Hardly ever is the problem only the other person, right? That's what we would like to, to be true, but reality is it's not. If, two people, if there is anger in any kind of relationship, it's nearly always that both sides contributed to the problem. So before trying to resolve a situation where someone is angry, we need to ask ourselves this question. What did I do? What could I have done differently? What could I have done better? Why is this person upset with me? I'm upset with that person, yeah, but I think that person is also upset with me. How could I have avoided that? And if we approach a conversation with the attitude of, I'm sorry for what I've done, I want to restore things, that usually goes a lot better than going to another person and saying, you've done wrong this, 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 and this. Let's examine ourselves first. And when we are angry, we ask ourselves the question, what, can, what did I contribute? What could I have done better? Let's look at ourselves. Take responsibility. Next important question, what is my anger trying to point to? Let me go to the, back to this example. Let's sh say we hear bad gossip. Why do I hate it? What is my anger trying to, to tell me? Maybe I'm hearing gossip, and in the back of my mind, I'm just thinking, uh oh, they're all gossiping. So maybe they're gossiping about me too. That's just selfish. That's unrighteous anger. You can't prevent people from talking badly about you. If they want to, they will, and they will find the opportunity. So there's really nothing we can do about that. And that kind of anger, we should simply let go and say, you know, whatever. But if I'm concerned about relationships, if I'm concerned about God, if I'm concerned about holiness, let's say if, hopefully not, but if there was a problem here in this group, in this church about gossip, it wouldn't be about me, but I would intervene and I would immediately say, this is not honoring God. We want to have close relationships here. We want to trust each other. And this kind of gossip destroys that completely. Let's not go there. Let's have a better way. So what is my anger trying to point to? What is it in my heart that is getting angry and why? And what are the details? Next question, does my anger influence my actions? And if yes, how? Is it a good change or is it a bad change? Like I said, anger in itself is not sin, but it does influence our actions. And we can choose what we do with our anger. Okay, when, we, when we are angry with someone else, do we then act by hatred, avoiding a person, gossip, bottle it up, and just be like, okay, I don't want to think about it? Is that our response? Or do we then say, I'm angry. I need to pray. I need to seek Jesus about what's going on. I'm angry, but I don't want to stay here. I want to initiate a reconciliation. I want to initiate a conversation. I want to hear what the other person has to say. I don't want to stay angry like this. I want to understand the other person more, specifically in marriage. Very often when we are angry with each other, it can lead to a deeper understanding. Because when we, I'm upset, when my wife is upset, and we use it to talk with each other, we very often understand each other more in the end. And we can say, you know, I was angry for a time, but something good came out of it. Because now that you expressed your anger and why you are angry and everything, now I suddenly know what, what values you have and why you got angry and what offended you in all these things. And now we can have a deeper relationship with each other. How do we act on our anger? Is it a positive change? Or 
Is it a negative change? Related question, does my anger influence the affected relationships in a positive or in a negative way? Can it lead us to deeper relationships, better understanding, better solutions, or it can lead us to isolation and separation? Anger can be a tool, and it can also be a stumbling block for meaningful relationships. How do we deal with it? What's the result of my anger? And then lastly, a good general principle. Take time to analyze your anger. If we act too quickly on anger, what usually happens is we make things worse. But over time, what happens is we calm down a bit, our anger subsides, then we can think more clearly, and then we can analyze ourselves and we can analyze the situation more objectively. Very often, we need to cool down first. Not act on our anger immediately, but simply say, you know, I'm not going to respond to this nasty email now. I'm really angry. If I reply right now or pick up the phone right now, things are going to go horrible. This is going to sit in my inbox for a day or two. And then I'll calm down. And then I'm going to reply. In marriage, sometimes we need that. We need to say to each other, things are heating up right now and this is not healthy. We are only getting worse. Let's stay away from each other for 30 minutes. Let's calm down. Let's pray. And then hopefully after that, we can have a better conversation than right now because our anger is just standing in the way of anything constructive. When we understand better what's really going on, then we usually take better actions to deal with our anger. Of course, we need to balance these two. Earlier I said we need to deal with our anger quickly. Now I say take your time. So there is a balance between these two principles. The important thing is we can deal with our anger internally quickly so that it doesn't grow roots. But at the same time, we can take some time, if it's appropriate, to act on our anger later on instead of making things worse. Anger has enormous power, both good and bad. True story that I just heard, um, church in the US, one of the mega churches that has tens of thousands of people attending every week. I love the church, uh, attended a conference in Shanghai that was organized by the church many times. Was I really love that church. Founding pastor, who has been leading that church for the last 40 years, just stepped down last month, six months before his planned retirement. He was forced out. Reason was several women accused him of inappropriate conduct towards them. As a result, of course, the church is in a mess. Many people who attend that church are confused. People taking sides. So there's now really, there's people who trust the pastor, there's people who trust the women, and they fight with each other and all these things pastor sees his whole life work being destroyed six months before his retirement. It's just ugly. Now, I want to say, I don't know if those accusations are true, and I'm not trying to say, defend the pastor, I'm not trying to defend those women who make those accusations, but when I listen to the whole thing, when I listen to his side of the story, when I listen to what some of these women say, what's at the core? Anger. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm just um, saying, okay, whatever happened, it doesn't matter. Of course, um, if the pastor really did these things that he is accused of, that's horrible, and then he has to step aside. So I'm not defending anything like that. But what I'm saying is the whole thing became really, really messy because of anger. The pastor admitted, I responded in anger. I accuse these women quickly and sometimes even more publicly of things instead of simply cooling down first, instead of simply saying, like, okay, I'll think about it, I'll pray over it, and then I'll respond later. Some of the things that these women said, they admitted, they've said them in anger. And it's just such a huge mess, simply because people did not deal with their anger 
in the right way. Now, like I said, that's not at the core of the problem. The core of the problem is, of course, that either the pastor misbehaved or that these women in the congregation are accusing him and creating a great, dis, uh, yeah, great confusion by lying, since there are only these two possibilities. But what I'm saying is they didn't deal with anger well, and that just made the whole situation so much more difficult and so much more messy than it has to be. Hearing that story really made me sad and angry, partly because I love the church and I really admire what they have been doing. But it made me also very concerned because my thought was, I don't want that to happen here. We are relatively small right now, but hopefully we will become bigger eventually and be 100, 200 people. And we will step on each other's feet. We will get angry with each other. Some of you will get upset with me or with the leadership because of some of the decisions I make, and you will not agree with them, and you will think, like, that's stupid. <laughs> that's just part of it. We will have different opinions about what the Bible says and how to interpret certain passages, and we will be tempted to get angry with each other over those things. We will get angry when we disappoint each other, when we say we help each other, when we say we pray for each other, when we say we support each other, and then we need each other in a specific situation, and then suddenly people are not around and can't help or don't want to help or whatever. That's part of community. We will get angry with each other. We will disappoint each other. And we will get upset with each other. Anger is part of living in community. We can't prevent that. But that's not a bad thing. But what we need to do is, let's use our anger the right way. And when we get angry with each other, let's make sure we use it in a constructive way. We build each other. We support each other. We pray for each other. We seek deeper understanding. And let's allow our anger to unite us as a community and not to divide us. I'm making a personal commitment, and I want to say anger in this church will, bring me, will encourage me to bring my anger to God and to use it for his glory. And anger in my family will cause me to solve the problems and deepen our relationships. That's a personal commitment that I'm making in response to this message and in response to everything that I've been preparing and studying and also applying to myself. And it is my prayer that all of us will make a similar commitment as well. In conclusion, how we deal with our anger is one of the most important keys to successful relationships. It's important for us to live in a Christian community and it's also important for our families for our marriages, for our children, for everyone around us, everyone that we are close to. If we deal with anger the right way, it can be a great tool. If we deal with it the wrong way, it can destroy our relationships and it can destroy our own lives. We will feel angry. That's just part of life. But we have a choice how we deal with our anger. We have a choice how we deal with it in our marriage relationships. We have a choice how we deal with it in our families. And we have a choice how we deal with it in this church, in our workplace, and all of it. If we deal with it the wrong way, we will reap the consequences and suffer. If we deal with it the right way, our relationships grow deeper over time. And God will get the glory of that. What kind of marriage, what kind of family life would you like to have? If you're single, what kind of future marriage or family life would you like to have? The answer to that question is directly linked to today's question. How do you deal with your anger? May we pray. 
Father, thank you that you're a good, good Father. Thank you that you love us. And thank you that you get angry at our sin. Thank you that you discipline us. You love us so much that you don't allow us to continue to harm ourselves or harm other people. And you have your ways of disciplining us and stopping us and preventing us from creating further harm. You have ways to deal with us that we can't even begin to comprehend. Lord, we thank you for your anger towards our sin. We thank you for your love that is expressed in your anger towards our sin. And Lord, we pray that you will help us to use our anger that we feel as well, to use it for your glory. To really seek you first and to really bring our anger to you and to truly say, God, I hate how I'm feeling right now. I hate these emotions. I hate being like this. But God, use it for your glory. Use it, Lord, to show me something about my reality, about how I see this world. Use it, Lord, to become more like you. Use it, Lord, to act in a way that glorifies you. Use it, Lord, to to get something right that is wrong right now. And use it, Lord, to show other people as well about something that is, right, that is not right right now. Lord, we want to pray for this church. We pray that you will grant us unity and that when we get angry with each other, you will help us to deal with it in a positive way. We pray for our families. We pray for our marriages. That when we get angry with our, the people who are closest to us, that we, we will use it, Lord, in a way that glorifies your name. We pray, Lord, in our workplace when we get angry, we will use it to shine your righteousness, to shine it forth and to show people, Lord, um, what it means to be angry with the sin but to love people. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you will help us to use everything we have and everything we want or to use everything that we go through, Lord, our joy, our happiness, as well as our sadness, our anger, our frustrations, all these things, Lord. Help us to use it all for your glory and teach us, Lord Jesus, to really live in your image to know that you feel these same emotions and that you've given them to us, Lord, to give us messages and to show us, Lord, that something is right or that something is wrong and to really use it for your glory. Lord, we trust in you. We thank you, Lord, for the emotions you've given us. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you will help us to truly honor you in the way we respond. For the glory of your name. Amen.